Um, thanks for staying with us. If you're just tuning in, we're discussing the future of leadership in Africa, and Dr. Sam Adeyemi is still with us. And remember, you can join the conversation, tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Way Show Africa One with the hashtag Ways, or you send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 803 Now, we're having so many questions uh, or comments or whatever, so let me just take a few before I come to you um, to my question. If Fuerco says, um, the foundation for me is realize the greatest resource um, realize that the greatest resource is the human life. That's what she's saying. Um, Joy says, the flight of um, people out of the country, do you see a situation where this talent would help rebuild Nigeria, the Nigeria of our dreams? So he's bringing it, um, she's bringing it back to Nigeria. John is mm -hmm. saying, do we start to build a selfless nation towards building? How do we start to build a, a, a selfless nation towards building prosperity for all? So maybe we should take those ones first. OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Um, leadership is about people, not essentially about equipment. Uh, that's management. But when it comes to harnessing the potentials of people, that is the essence of leadership. So we know that. The big question now is how. Um, so somebody is asking the people, who are shipping out of Nigeria, will they be useful in terms of our development? I believe so. Okay. Sincerely speaking, I've met quite a number of them. And I say to them uh, that when Nigeria is ready, we will realize that the competencies that we need have already been developed by Nigerians that have functioned in systems that work well and we will invite them to come in. I'll give you a biblical model. For example, the story of Moses. Though he was born to slaves, God in his providence did not allow him to be raised By in a slave camp for long. Yeah, he was moved to the palace <clears throat> and in the palace. So in the palace, he developed, you know, with a free mind. So when the vision for a new nation would be delivered, it was him that he was delivered to when he was describing the, the place where they would eat bread without scarcity, where they would own buildings of their own and businesses of their own. He could conceptualize it because the barriers created by slavery did not exist in his own mind. So I believe that Nigerians in diaspora have a very, very unique role to play in our development. So if you ask, OK, so how do we start you know, to develop um, this capacity for service in people. Well, I'll tell you again that in those countries that Nigerians love to go, service is walked into the curriculum from primary school. Hmm. Oh, yes. The kids are made to visit uh, shelters the for the homeless. Yeah. Shelters for homeless or orphaned, even animals. Okay, if you're applying to university from high school in the US, for example, they ask you to write a personal statement. One of the things they want to see there are the volunteer jobs that you've done. If you don't put anything there, they know they have a self-centered person who's going to come get this university education and be of no use to the community. Absolutely. We need to work that in to our curriculum, but as it is now, I always like to start with what I have. And that's what we Nigerians have to do now. You can shout from today to tomorrow about the governor or the local government chairman. If you cannot control them, you cannot control them. So why don't we focus on what we can control? Each person comes from a family. Hmm. So can we start in our families to build a different leadership culture where the purpose of leadership is not lording it over other people, but serving them and helping to bring the best out of them. So we can start with our own kids and we can start, especially as we nurture them into adulthood, to make sure we get them involved in service, in volunteer work, in caring, especially for the vulnerable in the community. Developing a leader is not a day's job. It's a daily job. In fact, it takes time. 
you, you are just answering all the questions that we have put down because I had written that how should family position themselves for the leadership reforms that we are talking about. But NASA had a question that applies to what you are saying as well. Well, so my, my question is actually, um, yeah, so we're talking about kids and, you know, in your article for the World Economic Forum, you had made a statement that, you know, the African youth population is a huge opportunity for the emergence of, you know, transformative leaders or the leaders of the future. My, yeah. my question is, do you still hold this view? I have a dissenting opinion. Looking at the kind of youth we have in Nigeria, for instance, I think that yeah. they're so entitled, you know, they lack this particular seed, the character, you know, and do you still feel like that they, they, they can be the future leaders with their character or can this character be built and who, who's responsible for this? Okay, very good question. Thank you. Yes, I believe, I still believe that they have the potential to transform Africa. I will be honest enough to say that I deeply empathize with them. Deeply empathize. They've been set back already. See, again, the developed countries, when you check them out, you will find out that they invest heavily in the cultivation of the human potential. Absolutely. And I mean the schools. Education is free. Free primary till you end high school. A few countries, education is free up to the tertiary level. Absolutely. Hmm. In Africa, so what do you have? So when your country has invested in you like that, it's not difficult for you to be patriotic. Why should they ask you to love your country when your country has not loved you? That's right. On social media, I observe the bitterness in our youth. They're angry and it shows. And unfortunately, because the investment has not been made in the use of the mind, they can't even identify who their enemy is. They can't analyze the problems very well. I check on social media, you have comprehension problems. Somebody is responding to a tweet or to a post, and it is obvious the person did not, the either did not read the post or certainly did not understand it. So uh, in that article, you know, that I wrote for the World Economic Forum, I said that Africa does not need charity. It needs good leadership, that whatever aid developed nations send to us, it will still come through that existing structure that we have, and the people at the top will consume most of them. That they should rather partner with people that are making efforts to empower young people. Some of us have to speak to these young people. And, and you would observe, I am heavily involved in informal education. Yes, some of the organizations that we have, we have a school, a formal school. But when I'm looking at the cultivation, the development of the people that we have now, especially that younger generation, I see a potential time bomb. I see a, I see crisis ahead of us. If these people are not cultivated, deliberately developed, and the environment created for them to realize their potentials, I see a big problem ahead of us. What goes into a mind comes out in a life. Once I look at the state of our schools now, I can describe what our country will look like in 30 years' time. Because in school, it's not only what is taught that the students absorb, they absorb the environment too. Absolutely. They absorb how the schools are run, okay? The management of the school. So I would say hope is not lost. When you are a leader, like I said, you have vision and you recognize potential in people. I recognize potential in the average young Nigerian. Now, the pandemic, the global pandemic has forced practically all of us to go online, to leverage technology, right? But Nigerian youths have been involved in technology for a while. What have they been doing with it? Fraud, Yahoo, Yahoo. Yet, if the environment was created to cultivate their talents, because what that tells me is that the Nigerian brain is good for <laughs> information technology, right? If we cultivated that without them living anywhere, just sitting in front of their life laptops, they could become millionaires. The wealthiest people in the world right now, the wealthiest businesses in the world right now are technology-based. 
this would be a bigger foreign exchange earner for us than crude oil. Okay, so we have little time left. So quickly, let's put in one, one question from ECD and I'll come to okay. you. Um, I totally agree with you, um, Dr. Sam. The youth are a reflection of our society. So um, what role does leadership play in attracting and sustaining um, businesses? Oh, you see, an organization is only as good as the people in it, period. An organization is only as good as the people in it. The quality of the organization is the cumulative quality of the people in the organization. So when there is good leadership in an organization, first, that organization is inspiring. It's motivating. It will be successful in the first place. It will be a place where somebody that you knew two, three years ago, before the person joined the organization, you see the same person now, and you see transformation has happened in the person's life. You want to go work there. So good leadership helps to attract good quality people to an organization, not only to attract, but to retain. See, uh, when you measure the things that give satisfaction to employees, money does not always come first, okay? People have a life. People want to feel loved. People don't want to die of depression and anxiety and fear and sadness, even if they're making the highest amount of salary that they could make. If you're married, let's say you joined an organization as, as a single person. Now you're married. Now you're having kids. Your life has changed. Your circumstances have changed. Is your organization sensitive to that? Okay. Are you given some room to be able to cater for your kids and so on while still contributing to the organization? Is once you don't have a convenient environment like that, you begin to look for somewhere else to go. So I'll say, Dr. Dr. Sam, like my Dr. good friend John Maxwell says, everything rises and falls on leadership. leadership. Fantastic. Dr. Sam, this takes me to my question about private sector. So I'm a socialist and people laugh at me when I talk about, you know, being concerned about the people and not so much the results. And what you find with the private sector across the world but in Nigeria is they're very capitalist so it's not people centered it's more just about the results and people have often also said because of the success it recorded in the private sector the public sector should emulate the private sector but I, I don't agree what are your views well my view is uh, a lot of the things people say are not backed up by data uh, agreed you can make a lot of money but is that the only measure of success for an organization? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. If you destroy people in the process of making that money, what really have you achieved? So I believe, yes, that the measure of success for a business, okay, the purpose why you set up a business is to change the world. And the immediate, the first derivative of it is profit. Without profit, the organization cannot exist. It will cease to exist. So the making of profit has to be prioritized. However, you've got to make people who will help you to make the profit. A lot of organizational leaders have gone the wrong way. Yes, domineering leadership, bossy, crushing people, stepping over people's feelings in the process of making the money. But at the end of the day, they, they end up being miserable. Sincerely, they end up being miserable. So I believe that we should have a balance of the two. Not only should we make money, we should build people in the process. Absolutely. Those Absolutely. that destroy people in the process of achieving success almost always regret it at the end of the day. <laughs> Absolutely. We are getting so many questions. Dr. Sam, we have to agree here that this is just the part one. Yes. <laughs> you have to promise us on national TV because <laughs> it is amazing the number of questions we are getting. Um, wow. Now, someone is saying that, um, first of all, we, if we're talking about all those reforms that you've said, what is a realistic tenure in terms of expectations for us to start seeing this reform? So if families start to do it right, if, um, right. if everybody begins to change their mindset. So what would be a realistic tenure for us? You know, since it took years for us to get here and it's going to take more years for us to go back, I think that would be the, because we're really <laughs> running out of time. So I, uh, what would okay. be a real, realistic, uh, what's it called, tenure to look at? 
Okay, it's difficult to put um, a timeline on it. If you look at it logically, you would say, oh, that's a generation, that's 25 years or so. But um, I read a book by Malcolm Gladwell titled Tipping Point. The thing is, you just continue to do what you can in a particular direction. And then the thing gets to a tipping point where it takes on a life of its own. Yeah. You don't need the whole country to change the whole country. Uh, I, put, I usually put it this way. Salt does not have to be the same quantity as the food before it will add flavor to it. True. You just need you know, a particular amount of people, usually not more than 5%, moving in the same direction and you literally create momentum and you shift things in a country. So I would say everybody should continue to do what they're doing. You know, I've been saying, the things I'm saying now, I've been saying for more than 20 years. I will tell you that 20 years ago, when you said the word leadership, outside of government or the elite class, you would hardly hear a discussion like that. You did not even hear such a discussion. But then 18 years ago, I started the leadership school. We call it the Daystar Leadership Academy because I observed that in the business schools, the business schools were too expensive for the average person to attend. Only people could attend. So the things they teach in business schools, we taught at very, very cheap rates. Presently, we've graduated over 40,000 people through our programs. So we're building momentum gradually. Somewhere along the line, we will get to the tipping point and everything will take on a life of its own. I think we can leave it there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Samadiemi. This has you. been a really, really insightful conversation. And uh, you have not said it, so that you're, this is part one. <laughs> you haven't done your commitment on it. I, I, you were giving me a public invitation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you but so sure. much. Thank you no, so I'd much. Like Thank you so much. But if you Thank had you one final time. word to say to the public, I mean, to leaders listening, what would you say to them to do right now? One word. Well, I'll just say to everyone occupying the leadership position right now, don't squander this opportunity. I beg you in the name of God. Thank you. Uh, deal with your own insecurities. Deal with your own fears. The best investment you will make ever that will build a legacy for you at the investments you make in people. Let's unleash the potentials of our people in Africa. Africa awesome. will become the <laughs> Awesome. That is, a, is a, the best way to sum it up. Absolutely. Now, please watch a repeat broadcast of this episode at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Um, it's been very insightful, ladies. And remember to keep all the conversations going on all our social media platforms as we continue to hear what you're saying. Now, in case you missed today's quote again, we'll repeat it for the third time. Leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character, but if you must be without one, be without strategy. Well, Remember to keep a date with us, but uh, Dr. Sama said, be with both. We with both. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See you tomorrow live at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Enjoy your evening. Okay.